Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about Chapter 7, Union Avoidance. Companies do everything they can to avoid a union. Uh, I was in banking for about 12 years. Um, I was wonderful. I loved being in the banking industry. Uh, but we were told, you know, as management of that bank, that if, if your branch or any area that you were management, managing ever even thought about becoming unionized, we were going to fire you. We were told that. So then that's all they said, period. But the continuation was, so you better not ever let anybody in your area start talking about unions. Companies can't stand unions. They fight them tooth and nail. They used to spend bazillions of dollars, and I mean bazillions of dollars, to stop unions. They still spend money to keep unions out, but they're more, they're more, they're more creative about it nowadays. They're more, they're smarter about it. Uh, whether that's good or bad, that's for you to decide. Uh, we just need to talk about how companies have this union avoidance policy. From the beginning of this country, 1776, basically, uh, the United States of America, until, goodness, uh, 1926, uh, there was absolutely an anti-union, almost an anti-worker feeling. Uh, just be thankful you have a job. Be thankful I've got some money to give you at the end of the day. Uh, don't think you're a good employee. You're just lazy. You're just good for nothing. But, you know, so you need to be thankful that I'm even hiring you. That was the attitude. In fact, labor didn't even have an identity. They weren't even a legal thing. So it's like, I don't care, you know, you're going to work for me, and if you are, I'll pay you if you're worth two, two cents, but if you're not, I, I, don't, I don't care about you. That was basically the philosophy. Then in 1926, up until 1935, you had this labor movement. People were finally fed up. Uh, there were enough jobs that people could come together in mass and fuss in mass. Politicians listened to that because in mass had a lot of votes. Uh, so things drastically changed. And by 1940, we entered into what was known as the period of corporatist. The corporatist period in industrial relations. What that means that basically from 1940 until 1970, because it changed again in 1970, but from 1940 to 1970 was called the corporatist era and what that said was the philosophy of labor unions is the philosophy of the country toward labor unions. The philosophy of companies toward labor unions was they're here to stay. They're just a necessary evil. We hate them. There's nothing we can do about them. Congress was dumb enough to pass all these laws that gave them all these rights. So we really can't fight that. We just have to put up with them and try to just minimize their input, but we can't get rid of them. They're here to stay. The corporatist era. And you can see that, obviously through the late 30s into the 40s, you can see that certainly in the 50s and in the 60s. Um, things changed after the 60s. The philosophy of the country changed. Um, all the hippies caused all the problems. We don't like those hippies. Uh, a lot of the times the workers were in sympathy with the hippies. Well, we don't like workers and we don't like the hippies and we don't like all this. And it was becoming, there was this liberal vent that was floating through America, uh, you know, anti-Vietnam, anti-government, anti what we thought was wholesome and pure. Uh, and a lot of this country looked at that and went, that's crazy, we don't like that at all. Companies looked at that and said, we don't like that at all either. In fact, we're tired of this union. We're tired of this liberal collective union kind of philosophy that says, 
the worker has rights to tell me, the man who invested all this money and gathered all this information to make this company run, and now you, Mr. Union Guy, are telling me you want part of this ownership and you think you deserve this? You're crazy. You want to be a part of this company? Buy some stock. I won't have a question with you. So in 1970, beginning in 1970, was what we call the resistance era where people were no longer saying, sure, the union's here to stay. Yeah, what's wrong with the union? People were saying, we don't need the union. The companies had been saying it all along, but workers started saying, we don't need the union. Why do I have to pay dues? Uh, yeah, you might make me a little bit more money, but by the time I throw my dues out and everything else, I'm not making any more money. My plight isn't really that much better. And something else had happened during the 1960s. Companies that were non-unionized looked around and said, God, our employees are leaving. We're, our turnover rate's real high. And they said, well, where are they going? And they looked around and they were going to these union companies, which are making just a little bit more money or a little bit more vacation or being treated with a little bit more respect, given a little voice. And a lot of these companies said, you know what? You mean all we have to do is give them like a quarter an hour more? All we have to do is put together a committee that says we'll sit down once, you can sit down with management once a month and we can talk about things, not that I'm giving you any authority or responsibility. Uh, you mean if I just act a little nicer toward these people, they won't be so eager to join the union? And lo and behold, that kind of worked. Okay, everybody understand that? All of a sudden, these non-union companies looked at these union companies and said, could we give a little of that to our people and just keep them at bay so that they would not be interested in joining a union? It would not be worth their while. And that's one theory that's come out, that the reason that union membership has dropped off to 12%, like we said early on, is that what's the benefit of joining the union? All of the companies now, all the progressive companies have participation groups. They give their employees voice. They sit down with them. They talk about things. Not that they follow their directions, but at least they sit down with them. Um, we've seen that a lot of times non-union companies lead the way in pay increases. So the unions really can't claim that in, a, in effect, except in a few industries, we really are paying you more than, ever, than not these non-union companies. So it's been really hard for the union, starting in the resistance era, starting in 1970, to convince people it's worth your while to join a union. Um, now, whether this is a Machiavellian approach from the companies or not, in other words, the end justifies the means. Uh, so as long as I can keep people happy, I'll give them a little bit more, that's fine. Whether that's going on or what, who knows? The point is, these companies have kind of raised the bar using a lot of these union companies benefits to say well if we if we kind of approach that why would anybody want to join the union and a lot of times that's what's happened there are other reasons that companies do not like unions so here are four facts forget that i just don't like you forget that i don't like you because you usurp my authority forget about all that there are four major things that we can measure that companies say see that's why we don't like these unions the first one is inflexible rules once the company signs that contract they have to follow it it is a contract we are a contractual country our legal system kind of revolves around contracts so once you sign it you don't have any well you know, back in January, that sounded like a good idea, but it's March and the environment's changed, something's changed. Let's just don't do that. Absolutely not. So, inflexible rules. Companies cannot stand that. Management likes to be able to make a decision depending on the conditions of the day. We know that it's a variable workforce. We know that it changes all the time, but we are stuck to this contract we signed two years ago and management cannot stand that. The second thing is, profitability is lower in unionized companies in the same industry as non-unionized companies in the same industry. Unionized companies make lower profits. 
you know, we can come up with a million reasons and we can do all kind of financial analysis to try to figure that out. Uh, might, maybe it's because they're not as flexible. Uh, maybe it's because the union does actually increase the cost of operation. There are many things written about that. And we're not here to discuss why right now. What a great research question, but that's not the issue right now. The issue is, the fact is, that unionized companies' profits are less than non-unionized companies' profits in the same industry. The third thing that drives managers crazy is shareholder value is lower in unionized companies than in non-unionized companies. Now, what do I mean by shareholder values? Stock price. You know, we use all these big words like shareholder value. Stock price. That's what we're talking about. The stock price of a unionized company is usually, and they put it in these regressions, you don't even know about all that stuff, but they put it in these, 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 these matrices that will show you that unionized companies' stock prices is usually lower than non-unionized companies. We can come up with several reasons for that. You've got, you've got $8 million you want to invest. This company over here is unionized. This company over here is non-unionized. Golly, if I put it in the unionized company, managers aren't free to make any decisions they make on the fly because of the contract, et cetera, et cetera. I want to give my $8 million to managers that have the flexibility to, miss, to, to interact with the dynamics of the workforce and the economic environment. So I'm not giving my $8 million to people who are handcuffed by contract. I'm going to give it to people who have the flexibility to change and do what they think is right at that moment. This is just what people think. What do you think? Um, the last one is company investment decisions are usually lower. And when I say investment decisions, excuse me, let me just finish. <coughs> excuse me, company investment decisions are lower for unionized companies than they are for non-unionized companies. And what do I mean by company investment? Building a plant. Expansion, putting on a new product line. These things are decreased at the union level. When I mean, not the union level, at companies that are in the union. Investments are lower. All of this expansion is usually lower at unionized companies. And the thinking is, you know, it's, it's, this is what research is all about. You observe the fact, and then you come up with a theory, a reason why this fact happened. We know we can measure that company investment for unionized companies is lower than non-unionized companies. Why? Why don't unionized companies build as many plants, come out with as many product lines, do as much R&D? And a lot of the thinking goes back to the restriction of the contract. These people are restricted. These unionized companies are restricted. They don't have the ability to grasp on to new ideas immediately. Uh, they can't just make these decisions and see what happens. Um, so the companies that are free to do that are more all willing to say, yeah, let's go invest in a new plan, which costs a fortune. Let's, let's look at these issues, these, these interactions. Let's look at doing partnerships with other companies. You're not unionized, they're not unionized, no big deal. You're a unionized company and you want to do a partnership with a non-unionized company, that's just going to be a red flag for that union, for that non-union company. They're going to, well, what's, what's the union going to have with this? What's their participation? And so, well, let's just don't even do it at all. So those four big things happen uh, in, in, in situations where this is why management hates unions. Uh, inflexible rules, uh, profits are down, shareholder value is down, and investments are down. Which brings us to other issues. A lot of people believe that unionized organizations have higher pay than non-unionized organizations. That's true in a few select industries overall. That is not true. In fact, non-unionized companies tend to lead the way in increase in wages. Uh, they do that for competitive reasons. They do that to get the best workers. They do that to hang on to the best workers. Um, so it's, it's kind of not true that unions make, the union members make a whole lot more money than non-union people do. That's just not what happens. 
There are also non-wage issues in union versus non-union companies. Um, unionized companies have lower turnover and they have higher rates of internal promotions. So there's some positive there. And companies like the fact that the turnover is low, but they don't necessarily like the fact that the internal advancement uh, is greater because when you promote from within in a union company, you're promoting union like union minded, union positive people. And the, 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 the company really is not crazy about that. In addition, unionized companies have very well established job posting parameters, job posting policies, where they let you know when a job is coming open. They let you know specifically what job it is, what skills it needs, how long you have to have been here. Uh, and they give you plenty of advance notice so that you can make the decision to throw your head in the ring and see if you can get that job or not. Uh, in a non-union company, most non-union companies do have job posting. Uh, we had it at the bank, we have it here at the university. Except when they don't want to have job posting. I can remember the bank, it was always job posting and you could always look. And then all of a sudden, you knew that somebody was getting ready to retire and all of a sudden you come in one day and they go, oh, here's Bob, he's the replacement. And you go, I really would have liked that job. I didn't see him. But oh, well, we had, oh, we bumped into Bob and it was just such a good fit and we needed to grab him while we could. So we just went ahead and made him the offer. So in a union contract, job posting has got to be followed. In non-union, you can have job posting when it's convenient, but if you don't, you don't have to. So there's no issue there. There are three basic components, three basic issues that the union that the companies use to avoid union. Remember, that's the whole thing here. We don't like unions. Uh, the first of these ways to avoid union is in hiring. During the interview process. Uh, you wouldn't say, do you like union or not? You wouldn't say that. You were very subtle. You would just kind of bring up, hey, have you heard about that You know, union across the street or up north? They're getting ready to strike. What do you think about that? Just in a conversational tone. And if you pick up any positive union flavor, guess what? I just don't think we're going to have you come to work for us. We thank you for your, your interest in this company, but you, we just found somebody who's a better fit. Uh, so through hiring, they try to identify people who would be positive toward a union, positive in starting a union, uh, and they're not going to hire those people. Second one, consultants. Uh, they call them union busters. They, are, they hire companies. Like I said earlier, companies spend millions of dollars to avoid unions. These people will come in and will sit down and they'll say, all right, Here's how you avoid the union. Now, back in the day, when I say back in the day, I'm talking in the 60s, early 70s, even in the 80s. It's like, all right, we're going to war. We're going to go like this. We're going to fight them at every turn. We're going to make it hard for them to come in here, et cetera, et cetera. And all that did was open up the court system. The unions could go and say unfair labor practices. Oh, they were just making it so hard. These poor people couldn't form the union, they couldn't keep the union because of all this negative stuff. Finally, consultants came in and said, look, this is not the way to fight the unions. The way to fight the unions is to make sure that people understand that they don't need the union. So maybe we need to look at some of your policies and say, you guys are idiots. You're treating these people so bad. Of course they want a union. You need to stop that right now. Uh, you need to be a more open. You need to give them more voice. You need to kind of be a little softer. It's not going to cost you hardly anything, but that's what you need to do because you have made them so mad, which is the first thing that on in our list of why you start a union. Quit making your people mad. That's what these consultants do. They come in and they say, you need to cut this out. You need to have more of this because you're truly you're insulating yourself from these workers and you don't need to do that. And the third thing is communication, which the consultants will tell you to do. We need to talk to people. We don't need to have one big meeting every six months and preach to them how good we are. That's not what we're talking about communication. I'm talking about daily communication. 
I'm talking about communication like a birthday list. I'm talking about like a, a little flyer that goes around once a week. Here are the new things coming up in the plant. Uh, here are new opportunities we have. Here's how good we're doing. Our workers are making a good wage. That kind of communication. Remind people, yeah, they've got a pretty good job here. Uh, it's not as bad as you think it is. None of us would really like to work if we could help it, but if you got to work, this isn't such a bad place to work. So communication is key. Absolutely communication is key. Now, we talked about how to become a union, I think it was back in chapter 6. Remember, you get mad, you call the union, and you go through bargaining unit and all that stuff. At the end, I almost talked about this, but I thought it would be better to talk about here about union avoidance. You remember how a, nine, a, a group of workers can go through a process and become organized, become a union? Y'all remember that? The same process can decertify a union, get rid of a union. So here's the deal. We, remember our example? There were 100 people in the, in the bargaining unit. We needed 51 votes. Guess what? We got 51 votes. Yay! We're the union. Well, guess what? 49 of your 100 people voted no. That was not an overwhelming majority. That was not a mandate. That You won by one vote. Which means, statistically, the same amount of people don't like the union that like the union. Uh, so again, that was the issue. So we end by one vote. And let's say we actually form a contract. Um, or not form a contract, right? It doesn't matter. The point is we're, we're, the, we're the recognized bargaining unit. I can decertify, let's say a month later, three of those people that voted for the union have now kind of are mad because they had to pay dues or whatever, and they don't like the union. So now you've got a majority that says, we don't like the union. We're tired of this. We don't want to have to pay these dues. Things aren't any better, et cetera, et cetera. You can decertify a union. You can vote to get rid of the union. But you can't do it within a measured year. There has to be a measured year between any vote, whether it's for the union or decertification. So, Make it easy. Our vote was on January 1. And by March, and it was by one vote, 51 to 49. And by March, we've got 10 people who are just, who voted for the union and said, I don't know what I was thinking. I just was crazy. I wish I had my vote back. So over the whole year, you've got more people not wanting the uh, union than have the union. So a year later, in January 1, you can call the company and you can call the, the NLRB uh, and you can have a call for a decertification election. Same process, same situation, all the rules still apply, except this time you're saying, you're handing out interest cards that say, we don't want the union. And you're also having the vote at the end. And the vote is to eliminate the union. So if again, 51% of that bargaining unit, which you once again had to identify the exact same process, you can, the, you can say the union is out of here. They do not represent us, and the company does not have to answer to or talk to the union because they don't exist here anymore. And if you wanted to start it all over again, you'd have to wait a whole other measured year to try to come back and get the union. Um, in 2009, there were 233 uh, uh, elections to decertify in the United States. Um, so it's not as uncommon as you would think. Uh, it happened right up here in Columbia, South Carolina about five years ago. The company went through a very vicious and hard-fought union uh, campaign, and the union won. And a year later, they went through a decertification and were decertified. And aren't the union anymore. So this talks about today in this lecture, we talked about how unions do not like, excuse me, how companies do not like unions and will do anything they can to avoid them. They don't want them to even come into the picture um, because they don't want to have to deal with them because of all the things we talked about. 
rigid rules, uh, uh, profitability issues, investment issues, um, and just the plain fact I'm the boss and I don't want to have to share my responsibility and authority with anybody else who's not being picked as a boss. Um, so I hope that kind of clears up some of the things about how unions, how companies try to avoid unions. Uh, so you don't have to do that.